The cyclical bull market for equities is over and the economic recovery has run its course and we're about to get hit hard with a 40% correction in stocks in April. My guest today is the best-selling author of various books, including his latest Zero Hour. He is the founder of HS Dan. Please welcome to the show uh, Harry Dent of HarryDent.com. Harry, always good to be with you. Yeah, nice to be back, Daniela. Yeah, nice to see you, although uh, you're not bringing a lot of good news here. 40% correction in stocks coming in April. Uh, let's talk about your latest forecast. Well, you know, uh, we, we've been in a down, a slowdown in the economy since 2007 because the baby boomers peaked in spending. That's something I was predicting for 20 years. That's our 40 year and our demographic cycle, which is quite precise. And so what have we gotten? Quantitative easing to fill the gap. Well, quantitative easing has created the biggest financial asset bubble. You look at stocks today and think we were in the greatest economy getting ready to get way greater. And what we've really had is, a, is an unrecovery. You know, we've been growing at 1.65% since the 2009 bottom with massive stimulus, with almost with very low inflation. We should have high inflation and high growth with this much stimulus. And it's because they're fighting a declining tide. And, and the cost of this, not allowing a recession, not allowing the bubbles and the debt to shake down like, like, like we normally do, uh, we've got the, a monster financial asset bubble. Daniela, the most important number in the world right now is $520 trillion. That is, by the way, 6.2 times 84 trillion GDP in financial assets, stocks, real estate, bonds, that sort of stuff. That I, it, normally that would be two times GDP, maybe two and a half in a normal boom. Yeah. Uh, debts at 253 trillion, that's off the charts, over three times global GDP. And but normally that'd be one and a half, you know. So we but they they use this financial asset bubble to offset the debt deleveraging and the debt bubble bursting. And now we have a bigger monster. And I am predicting within weeks or months, the, the, the central bank's just going to lose control over it. It's just going to burst. If you notice, and, and this is the reason for my prediction here that we're going to see a 40% plus crash in yeah. just the next few months, every correction since the January 2018 top, that was when the real bubble started to top. And then we get all this seesaw backing up. We get a crash, we get a new high, and then we every time we've got a crash to new lows, which means the market is trying to go down. We've peaked. And the next new low would project 2,100 on the S&P 500. That would be 45% from the recent top, that would mean the tech stocks would go down even more, maybe 50%. So I think the next crash, what people finally see is, is the central banks keep pumping up the economy against these downtrends, creating this monster bubble that keeps wanting to burst and deleverage along with the debt. And, and then and, and it's a losing battle and when and when people say, well, well, yeah, don't print another. I'm sorry, don't don't bother to print another 10 trillion this time. This thing's over. This thing they lose control, and that's just going to be the first crash, and we'll end up by late 2022 or early 2023 back down, you know, 80 to 90 percent to to basically erase this entire crazy bubble. Now remember, greatest bubble in history has occurred from 2009 into 2021 with the weakest recovery in history is the biggest disconnect between stocks and financial assets and the real economy. And guess which one wins? The financial assets and the stocks have to come down to reality. Hundreds of trillions, Daniela, at least 200 trillion minimum of this 520 is going to disappear in the next two to three years. And that does not cause a recession. That causes a depression. Wow. OK. I have a, a lot more questions now. Um, so one, just just getting back to the central bank. So you're saying that the Fed can't even, with the, with the correction coming, the Fed can't even save it here with their liquidity pumping? Okay, what did they just do? We had the COVID crisis, perfect yeah. trigger by the way, because it's hit a, a death blow to the economy. We've recovered V-shaped 80% back, but we can't get back to 100 because there's a lot of industries that simply can't. Travel, entertainment, large parts of retail, on and on and on. So they printed in eight months as much as they did in the entire 80-month yeah. QE cycle before. So they're having to print exponentially more to stop each crisis. 
And guess what? We're already the consumer spending, and I've been predicting this, already weakening again. And 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 basically, people say, well, wait a minute, you just printed so much. I mean, the, now the market did race to new highs on that, but the market's way ahead of itself, and the economy is not following it. So when people see it doesn't matter how much they print anymore, they're going to have to print $10 trillion next time. Um, and, and people are just going to say, I'm sorry. The investors are going to say, I'm sorry, I'm not betting on this double down, double down, double down, double down theory. Because you know what happens when you keep doubling down. I don't care how many times you win, you end up at zero. So on the note of consumer spending, Harry, are you not confident in reopenings helping the economy? <laughs> Guess no. not. No, here, here's what I see. You know how long this vaccine is going to take to be effective? At least late summer, early fall. You know how long that is? That's light years in an economy that's way overstimulated and, and all these problems. And, and, and we're not handling the, the COVID well. I, I sometimes believe the theories that it's a secret plot by China to, to uh, you know, put a virus out in the world that Westerners don't, can't adapt to. Asian cultures are conformists. They do what the government says. They lick this thing right off. We don't lick it. Oh, we don't want to wear masks. You're taking away our freedom. That's the Western response. So we're not handling it well. This thing's going to be around longer. And yes, eventually the vaccine may eradicate. I say between now and, and, and next fall, this whole thing's going to fall apart before the vaccine can be effective. Then it's not going to even be an issue. Oh, yeah. People are less worried about the thing, but everything's crashing and then people are spending less. You know how it, it, it's it, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy once a downturn gets rolling. We have so much leverage. Again, remember the number, 520 trillion financial assets in the world, 6.2 times GDP. That is like a mushroom cloud getting ready to just implode. There is no way to stop that once it starts. They, they couldn't print. So again, Remember the other number, at least 200 trillion will disappear. So are they going to print $200 trillion to replace that deficit? I don't think so. Harry, uh, you know, in your book, A Zero Hour, uh, you know, you don't, you don't speak about the pandemic per se, but you do speak about a series of disastrous events uh, that have been timetabled for, for decades. Um, I believe in the book you were looking at early 2020. So are you just a bit off on your timing then in terms of, uh, you know, the, the market imploding here? No, no, there, there is no timing anymore, Daniela. This thing could have peaked in late 2009, early 2020. COVID came in and the government, the Federal Reserve, and now for the first time, fiscal stimulus. So, so here, here's, here's the series here. 3.6 trillion printed as much as all the QE before in a short period of time. Government comes up with about 3.6 trillion in stimulus, and this time they give a lot of it direct to consumers and businesses, which is at least the better thing to do than just pumping up financial assets and making the rich richer. And now Biden wants another 1.9 trillion. Add all that up. Oh, we got about nine trillion. Oh, let's call that over 40 percent of our GDP. We're money printing or fiscal stimulus to offset a short-term downturn. Oh, how long can you do that? Oh, we're going to have a $4 trillion deficit probably in hindsight for this year and series of $4 trillion deficits. We're going to be at $40 trillion um, debt by 2024. And I predicted this before the crisis because one way or the other, we've been doubling our federal debt every two administrations um, since, the, since Bush. OK, five to 10 to 20. And now Trump comes in at 20 and it's going to be 40 by the time the next election comes and the next president comes in after this because of all these deficits. So we, there's no way out of this. You can't keep fighting reality by just printing more money, something for nothing, and expect that the way you actually deal with it is you restructure debt, get rid of zombie companies, clear the decks so the economy has room to grow again and, and, and resources and people can be deflated. It doesn't, none of that happens when the government keeps covering everything over with free money. Banks don't have to write down loans. Oh, zombie companies don't have to fail. So what do they do? They limp along, employing people barely, surviving barely. That's our economy. That's why it's growing at one and a half, 1.6%. 
uh, and the baby boomers are in a downward spending trend and the millennials will not turn up until 2023, 24. And that's what's going to, that's the good news. That's what's going to pull us out of this. If we let the bubble burst, deleverage debt, deleverage financial asset bubbles. That's what we did in 29 to 32. And guess what? We came screaming out of that downer. It was nasty, but we deleveraged a lot of debt and financial bubbles. Right. And that allowed the economy to grow. You can't grow from here. As Glenn Beck said in, a, in an interview I did with him recently, you know, bull markets don't start from these heights and valuations of bubbles. It's impossible to start a new bull market. Our economists are saying, oh, we're going to have a new bull market with COVID. No way. I say no way. These economists don't understand economics. That's why I stopped taking economics in my third course and studied business instead. And that's why you hate being referred as an econ economist. Oh, that's right. Um, Con yeah. Economists hey, look like they never had sex or run a business. <laughs> Harry, you, uh, you know, offline, we were saying this is an event, what you're, what you're describing, what you're forecasting, unlike anything we've ever or in our lifetimes yeah. will see, correct? So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, again, I'm a cycle guy, tw 90 year. You look at stocks long-term and I look at everything long-term. It gives you perspective. One clear cycle stands out like a sore thumb, 90 year super bubbles, 1839 to 42 crash, 1929 to 32 crash. Um, and, and, and now 2020, 21 into 22 or 23 crash. This is a constant rhythm and that is meeting a 40 year cycle, which I've been <clears throat> preaching. I've been, I've said in the early eighties, we'll have the greatest boom in history and we'll see the lowest point in stocks in late 2022, 1942 generation bottom, 1982 in stocks, Bob Hope generation bottom, and now baby boom bottom in late 2022. So we got the greatest up cycle colliding with the greatest down cycle two, two and a half years later. And I do see the biggest crash of our lifetime. I've been saying this for years and years and the boom. And when we started to bust in 2008 and afterwards, and we never finished the process, we could have had this bust 2008 and nine could have gone into 2010 and we could have had that 29, 32 shakeout deleveraging and bigger crash. No, they turned on the fire hoses, didn't want to deleverage debt. The price of not deleveraging debt is to create the biggest asset bubble in history, which is going to burst harder and faster than, than that debt bubble would have. They've created a bigger monster and it's harder to control. You have to ask yourself, what takes longer to deleverage debt with chapter seven and chapter 11 reorganizations, which takes months or years, or just to have markets crash suddenly like they did in, in February, March last year. You know, that was 40% global in stocks, five weeks. That's how fast a financial asset bubble can deleverage. So, that, so these Federal Reserve people who've never had sex or run a business have, 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 done the, a grand experiment that is going to backfire on them. And I do not think you'll have a basis for a Federal Reserve or central banks after this crash. People will say, oh, all they did was create the biggest bubble and crash. And oh, you know what? You go back to when they were created, 1913 for the first time, 20 years later, Roaring Twenties bubble, 1932 crash, 33 bottom in depression, 25% unemployment. This is what central banks do. Pump, 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 make things look good today, create bubbles, overextend, and then crash. <clears throat> They've done it again, bigger time. And Harry, do you think uh, there's a correlation there between why there's also a, a huge push towards central banks wanting to roll out digital currencies? Is that some way out <laughs> of them getting out of debt? Do you see any link there? No, they're just trying to fight the, the real Bitcoin and blockchain revolution. They're going to be a big crash first because this is a big first stage bubble like the dot coms on a 20 year lag. I've got this in my February newsletter, just perfect correlation. You can see Bitcoin is going just like the dot com. Big bubble on high valuations on an early stage, which is way overvalued. Big crash. A lot of them go under and then the real revolution comes and you got the Internet being the biggest boom in history into recently. So that's the same thing going on here. Blockchain can restructure monetary systems with a potential Bitcoin gold-like standard at some point when Bitcoin gets high enough and stable enough where you could have a bottoms-up system that grows totally 
by transactions of, of, of consumers and businesses and governments and is no longer top down micromanaged by central banks and politicians who always overstimulate, always push down their currencies to cheat for exports. All governments do is manipulate in the wrong way. We got to get rid of this. Now that brings me real quick, 250 year, another giant cycle hitting here. This is very rare, Daniel, you see this many. The Protestant revolution, 500 years ago, took down the Catholic Church down to, 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 to where, reality, okay? They controlled everything. And then the monarchs controlled everything. Well, democracy in the United States, late 1700s, 250 years ago, took down that and brought you know democracy and free market capitalism from Adam Smith in Scotland and a whole industrial revolution. This now, I think this revolution is about bottoms up monetary system. Again, everything's about let the people make more decisions, let power go downward, decentralized. And, and this whole GameStop thing was just yeah. the first little taste that little guys can take down a hedge fund. Whoa. Yeah, I wanted to talk to you uh, about that. I'm happy you brought that up. Um, you know, I, I think Mark Cuban was even talking about this yesterday, saying like, this is not going to go away. It's not like some guys lost money, you know, put their tail between their legs and they're not ever really coming back. I mean, how will this change the landscape of Wall Street here? I mean, are hedge funds going back to the table not thinking, okay, we need to strategize. How do we stop this from happening again? How does this play out, Harry? Okay, here, here's what happened. We have a lot of imbalances in the economy. Let, let me draw a quick picture for you. Yeah. Federal Reserve and central banks decide to print massive amounts of money to pull us out of a recession that looked like a depression, and it would have been a depression. They were right about that. So they wanted to pump our way out of it. They print all this money that only goes in, they're only buying bonds and, and financial assets in the markets. They're adding new money printed out of thin air to an existing base of financial assets. Number one, that's gonna push up assets and always end up more in stocks in the end, okay? Number one. Number two, Wall Street, all the big hedge fund managers and leveraged traders, they say, oh my gosh, now that we know that the Fed's going to consistently push up stocks and down short and long-term interest rates, we can make leveraged bets. We can add a lot of leverage now to long-term trades. So they're adding leverage on top of the financial injections by the Fed. So now there's even more money chasing those stocks. And what it's led to, and, and I've been warning uh, everyday traders and investors about this for many, many years, exactly what's been exposed here. The large traders see everything. They got better information than us, faster transactions, more access to leverage. They see when, when everybody's going in one direction, they will attack it with what I call predatory investing. It's not just simply, oh, we think this market's going too high, so we'll bet against it and short. No, they short with 10, 20 times leverage and they push the markets down strongly force all the bullish people to capitulate. And when they capitulate, they turn around and buy their stocks and then play the next run up. It's predatory. It's not good investing and it's not fair to everyday investors. Well, these everyday investors now get on you know, Robin Hood and Reddit and they can talk and they're like, now they're saying, well, you know what? They look at everything we do. There's one thing we can see that they're doing. We can see when they're overshorting a stock. And what they do is they, now we see them, they're, they're leveraged to the hill, expecting to push it down. What if we push it up with thousands of traders against them, force them to capitulate the other way? In other words, this GameStop, this Robin Hood Reddit trade has done to the hedge funds what they do to everybody else. So to me, what's important here, Daniela, yeah. we're exposing an imbalance in the markets. There shouldn't be so much leverage. Lever options and futures were created so real businesses could hedge real commercial risk on having to buy or deliver commodities or, or financial assets in the future. It wasn't designed for predatory investing and to leverage up and just push, manipulate, force markets down or force markets up. And again, now the little guys can do the same thing. So good win for the little guys. But what it does is exposes is I think it's going to be a big issue, especially when this bubble crashes again, just like people will finally question, well, did central banks do us more good or harm? Answer, harm. It'll be, wait a minute, all this, whether the central banks are, are manipulating markets with leverage or gangs of traders, mobs of traders, let's call them, it's not a good thing for investment. It creates a casino economy. And so I think there's going to be simple regulations. All you have to do 
is, is disallow high leverage except for things that are really uh, hedging operations and not for predatory investing. So I think this is part of the revolution of many things and it's gonna be a good change when it happens. But again, it's gonna take the bubble bursting and people seeing the cost of excessive monetary creation, a cost of excessive leverage and in investing, creating such a bubble that when it bursts, it overnight destroys two to $250 trillion. <laughs> Again, you can't have that much money disappear without creating a depression. This will not be a recession. On the other hand, my good news is because I understand demographics and understand right. how fast you can deleverage these things, like 29 to 32, I think by 2023, we're going to be coming out of this with the millennial generation. So this is not going to last 10 or 12 years. Okay. But the next two or three years is going to probably be the worst we see in our lifetime. Okay. So not 10, not, not 10, 15 years, but okay. I want to wrap with uh, people's money and protecting people's wealth, because that's what I care about at the end of the day here, Harry. So basically what I'm hearing from you is no sector gets saved come April. But except, except for the highest quality bond, the best safe haven, you can go yeah. to cash and preserve while everything goes down. That's good. What is great is to buy a 30 year, the longest duration, safe treasury bond. That will be the safe haven because because that will that will their rates will go from 1.8 be pushed down to near zero. That'll cause that bond to appreciate 40 percent or more when everything else drops. Normal corporate bonds will drop some, junk bonds will drop more like stocks. There will be very, you're right, there will be very little places to hide cash, cash flow assets, solid cash flow assets, and the most highest quality bonds. And that would mean only AAA corporate bonds. I'd still rather have the 30 year treasury bond. Okay, 30 year treasury bond. Harry Dent, why not gold? Because gold is an inflation hedge. This is going to be like 2008 started to be before they turned on the fire hoses to combat it. And that's why we haven't had inflation. They're, they're combating deflation, <clears throat> which always comes after bubbles. OK, so it, it's going to be a deflationary process and gold edged up into the 2008 recession, the early stages. And when they saw Lehman Brothers goes up and saw the deflationary breakdown, gold went down 33 percent, 33 percent in like two months and silver 50 percent. So gold will not go down as much as some commodities, but gold is not going to be the safe haven in a deflationary environment. And Bitcoin is not either. Bitcoin is not a safe haven, nor is it an inflation hedge. And the institutional money in Wall Street is buying Bitcoin as an inflation hedge instead of gold. It's not gold. It could be gold in 15 years. It's not gold. It's not an inflation hedge. It's not a safe haven. It is the biggest bubble, which means it will ultimately burst the biggest along with stocks. And, and, and you're else. right. Gold did go down uh, with the Lehman Brothers and, uh, and, and, and that catastrophe. But what happened right after? It wasn't long that it was down. It right? was only because so it down, they turned on the fire hoses and gold right. loves money printing because so they see inflation. Right. Now, gold went up, Daniela, and then in 2000. Uh, uh, 12, it went right back down because even with all the money printing, we still didn't, we, inflation was still going down at some point and gold finally realized, oh my gosh, you and gold bugs have been wrong about this. You don't get money, you don't get inflation in a deflation era. All you do is curb deflation. You're not. I tell people in speech, and I say this seriously, there is no way in hell you can create high inflation, nevertheless hyperinflation, in this winter season deflationary environment with so much debt and bubbles always pushing to deleverage, which is always, always, always deflationary. Nine out of 10 financial crises in developed countries have been deflationary, not inflationary. So I have to argue with the damn gold bugs too. I was introduced at a gold conference as the contrarian's contrarian. They think they're contrary. I am contrary to them. We both see a crisis, but I see deflation that changes the investments that do well. Right. I, I understand. So right now, you're in you're in uh, thirty year treasury bonds and cash. Right. That's your prime. That's where your portfolio is right now. Well, yes, that's right. And also, I think it. And this is where risk tolerance come in. People can just simply unlevered short stocks. Just short the S and P five hundred. Short you buy. I think it's. Um, 
PQQQ and you can be just simple one time short the NASDAQ, that is gonna go down. You can do that 10, 20, 30% of your portfolio. I wouldn't do it 100% because it because downturns even more volatile, but shorting stocks, the one asset that goes down the most consistently and does go down the most, more than real estate, more than bonds, is stocks. So you can be, the, the ideal portfolio is maybe 10% cash, 50% 30-year treasuries, and, and 20, 40% or something like that, short stocks, but not leveraged, you know, just simple short. And let me end on this. I could keep going on forever with you, but let me end on this. I want to pick your brain on this. How do you resist the temptation to not follow the fever, right? Bitcoin fever or Ethereum today as we're speaking or GameStop, you know, what conversation do you have with yourself and say, hey, it looks so tempting. I could really make a lot of money here. How do you stop yourself? Or, you know, what do you think in your head and say, look, don't, don't do it. Well, well, you have to understand bubbles. You can make money in bubbles if you're quick, okay? The people who got into GameStop to push it up first and got out first made a bunch of money. Most of those everyday traders that jumped on is like, oh, this is fun. Oh yeah, we are killing the bad guy. Well, then it went back right back down to 112, okay? 42, it went up to 482 and down to 112 in the same day. So that a lot of people got killed on that. You have to understand the nature of bubbles. If you're gonna be in them, be in them, look at the progression. I, 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 one of the things I do, and I hate to admit this in public, but I use the Masters and Johnson's male orgasm uh, documentation from their study in the 1950s. It is a perfect exponential bubble curve <laughs> ending in an orgasm. And what you have to understand about that is that bubbles, when they do burst, as fast as they go up, they go down twice as fast and they always go back to the bubble origin where it starts and wipe out the entire okay. bubble. What point of cycle would you say Bitcoin's at then? Because if you speak to Bitcoin pundits like Max Kaiser and they're looking at 220,000 as, as, as a target in this year, they'd say, you gotta zoom out of the chart. You can't zoom in. You gotta look at the chart from far away and you'd see the volatility is not, not so bad, but you're obviously saying not the case. Okay. Yeah, yeah, those guys don't have long-term perspective, but they are right. I have two scenarios that Bitcoin's either just peaked or about to peak on a more linear progression, or I have an exponential chart now that they've broken some key levels on the upside, which is a positive thing for it. It could get as high as 160,000 near term or 300,000 if it can last the end of this year. All I right. still say it's going to crash 95%. So if you're getting in now, I think it's late. It could go up or down. But I'm saying by the end of this year, and I think more likely sooner, it's going to peak and you're going to see a bigger crash than you've seen yet. And you're probably going to see Bitcoin back at three to 4,000. That is when I would load up the truck. That would have been like buying Amazon in the 2000, 2002 crash at the bottom at $6 down from 133, okay? At what price would you buy gold at? When would you load up on gold? If it fell below that, what level? That's a great question. I've had this target for a long time. I think it's going down to a thousand, back down to the 2015 low or a little lower. That is going to be a lot less. That's only be a 50% crash from here at most. Most commodities are going to end up down 70, 80%. Then I would buy it because because gold is going to be another 30 year commodity cycle. And gold's going to be one of the leaders because one of the outstanding things in the next 30 year commodity cycle is going to be driven less by inflation and more by Asian buying and Asians love gold. Chinese and Indians per capita, I mean, per income buy even more gold than anybody. So, so gold will be a good buy uh, probably two years from now near the bottom of the stock crash. And, and, and I'm, I'm guessing 950 to 1,000. Okay, wait, last point. So silver would have to be below what price? 15? Silver probably be more like five, six, seven. Oh, that it's low. more volatile than gold, always is. Okay. You would only buy silver around five, six, seven. No, no, I'd have to see how it's trading versus gold. I would use gold as a, I would use gold as a better timer and buy silver when I think gold's bottoming, whether it's, it's six or 12. Okay. okay. I think I got in all my questions, Harry Dent. Um, thank you. I, I, I'm in Puerto Rico with a lot of Bitcoin people and they are great. And they are tech, yeah. you know, Alex Lightman and Michael Turman, these people are genius, but, but I try to make it simple because, because it can be very techy. This thing is following the dot-com emergence and 
bubble and crash and will follow the long trajectory and final bubble very similar and and that's a way to make some sense out of it you got to go find peter schiff he's down there too and then we can just i've had i (laughs) i've my wife's friend with his wife we met him at dorado country club in person now i debate him all the time and i've debated him i debated him just two months ago in in an australia online webinar i'm sure he loves your thoughts on bitcoin i'd I'd say yeah that's right yeah he yeah that's one Uh, place where we agree (laughs) all right harry dent uh you're a ball of fun i love the energy thank you so much Okay. Enjoyed it, Daniel. Uh, Let's do it again soon. And thank you for watching. We'll have much more for you. So be sure to stay tuned to Stansberry Research. In the meantime, keep following us on all our social media platforms. Thank you for watching. I'm Daniela Kimbo.